for joining us here this evening. We're going to talk all about the book, uh, the new book coming out, Snake Falls to Earth, and we're going to get the chance to, uh, you know, uh, just chat a little bit for wonderful folks here. And um, yeah, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for all the kind words about my writing. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And, and of course, like, you've been a big inspiration just for me as a comic fan and also just the the work that you create so you're also like a creator and like the owner of this store so i'm just so happy to be able to do this event with you well it's sincerely my pleasure uh you know we we uh, like we were just saying you know for the few folks that are now just jumping in uh we love to do these things live uh it's we're still in a day and age where it's it's you know a 50 50 also getting people into travel very difficult but We've opened up a lot of really cool things to be able to do virtually uh, and through the internet. So, you know, you can get the chance to, to talk to folks and have folks kind of listen that you normally wouldn't. So this is really, really cool. Um, so I just wanted to first start out by saying the, the book is out. Uh, we have it. Uh, we put a link to it in the shop. Uh, so you can see all about it in the shop. It's right there. So I just want to make sure and we'll remind you at the end. Uh, of our conversation. Um, but I would like to just jump in. And uh, my first question in sort of reading this and uh, just the, where did, the, like, I, I know from the last book, where did this concept come from? How did this, like, where did this just spark in your brain? I got to hear that first. And then we're going to, we'll let you read a little bit, but I got to hear where this came from. I was just, I was like, how did you think, how did you come up with this? It's amazing, so. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so this is my second book. And in my first book, actually, that concept was percolating. And I was thinking about it since I was a teenager. So Elatsue is about a teenager who can raise the ghosts of animals. Uh, and she ends up investigating a mystery. And in the process of writing that book, I briefly touch upon uh, animal people. So they, they aren't really featured in the way that they're featured in Snake Falls to Earth, but there's a couple of scenes where, in one scene, it's a story uh, of the past where uh, the main character's sixth great grandmother actually interacts with like a coyote and a bat person. Uh, then there's another scene in the present where they see uh, coyote's daughter. Uh, and when I wrote those two very brief parts of the book, I realized that I wanted to write more. Um, and part of that is because just the traditional stories that I grew up hearing, like they, they involved a lot of different uh, people. Uh, and many of those were animal people and like even plant people. Um, so I ended up writing a snake fall search is based on the concept, okay, there's going to be this world where animal people live with, you know, monsters and they go on adventures. Uh, but the more I kind of thought about that, the more I realized I wanted to tie it to Earth and, and a lot of the things that we're going through now and, and probably will go through in the near future in terms of environmental changes, specifically in Texas, which is um, where I'm from and where the human characters in my books are from. Um, so A Snake Falls to Earth is actually told through two different perspectives. Um, the first is a human teenager named Nina who lives in this near future version of Texas. But the second is this cottonmouth person named Ollie who lives in an entirely different world. Um, but as we find out, the two worlds are actually connected in a very important way and they end up helping each other um, save their friends and family. Um, so it is kind of like a fusion of uh, futurism because this is envisioning our future, but also it's linked to, um, well, at least I get, I get inspiration from a lot of personal things, including um, the stories that I heard growing up. Uh, and of course, the, the past of the human character is also very important to describe what's happening with her uh, present day uh, family, which turns out to be quite weird. <laughs> it's it's a it's a running theme and i and i you know this, these themes around family and i want to talk about that a little bit uh you know a little bit later but 
I would love it if you would share for us a little bit, uh, you know, sort of a little bit from the book, because I think that's a good way for us to kind of segue and let folks hear a little bit from it. So if you'd like to do a little reading, that Absolutely. would be awesome. Absolutely. And I, I'm going to read a, a small bit from chapter one, and a small bit from chapter two, because it, it kind of uh, shows you how these two different perspectives uh, come through in the book. It's, it alternates between them uh, chapter by chapter. Uh, and I actually wrote one in the first person and another in the third person. Uh, so chapter one, uh, Nina, age nine. So this is when she's, she's quite young. She, she's actually a teenager through most of the book. On the hospital bed, her delicate body cradled between thin white pillows, Rosita dreamed. Pictures in metal, plastic, and wooden frames surrounded her, displaying images of friends and family, giving the appearance of an audience. However, the only visitor in the room was Nina, who sat on a tin chair beside the hat rack shaped IV pole. Nina couldn't stop looking at the sepia toned photograph in an oak frame. Propped on the window ledge, it featured a portrait of great great grandmother Rosita as a young woman. The picture came from an era long before digital cameras. In those days, people posed in front of a boxy camera and had to wait days to learn whether they blinked. In her portrait, young Rosita wore a hundred strings of pale seed beads around her neck against her buckskin closed chest. Some had glinted each glass bead a mirror for the sun. Young Rosita's fine black hair had symmetrically framed either side of her face. With dark, intense eyes, she stared directly at the camera lens as if challenging the photographer to blink first. In most old timey photos, the subjects didn't smile, but young Rosita's lips quirked in the suggestion of stifled laughter, as if she'd remembered a joke, one she could barely wait to share. In the hospital room, Rosita's hair fanned across her pillow in thin white wisps. Her eyes, now opening slowly and warily, were sunken. Advanced age had sculpted her face against the contours of her skull, revealing sharp ridges that had once been hidden by plump cheeks. Without her dentures, Rosita's thin lips curled inward. Rosita looked toward Nina. Did she need something? Water? More medicine? In anticipation, Nina opened the speech-to-text translation app on her phone. Don't worry, she said. Dad's coming back soon. And after lunch, Grandma will visit. Nina's father was speaking with doctors beyond the closed door. Are you okay for now, Abuelita? Great-great-grandmother didn't speak much English. Unfortunately, Nina knew even less Spanish, but her attempt to communicate worked. Because of the word abuelita, Rosita's lip quirk creating the same anticipatory, gentle smile that shone from the old photograph. All right, and um, now I'm gonna read a little bit from the second chapter, which is told through the perspective of Ollie the Cottonmouth. And it's called Cottonmouth is Cast from Home. I can't remember when I learned about the path to anywhere you please. It's one of those stories everyone seems to know, like a persistent thread of gossip. But I'll never forget the day it found me completely by chance in the terror of Robin Kep Forest. Thing is, I didn't realize the path was special until I'd already walked it. Where would I be now if I'd known? Mama was overprotective. She didn't chase me from home until I was 15 years old. It happened during a calm midsummer morning. I was napping on the river bank, dreaming about the sunlight. Real sunlight, the kind that's so bright and warm it almost burns. You can still bask in the dimly radiant light that slips into the reflecting world, my home of spirits and monsters, the pseudo sun we call it, but it's no perfect substitute. Without so much as a greeting, Mama plopped a rucksack, <laughs> a rucksack full of supplies onto my chest and hissed, wake up, Ollie, you're ready. I clutched the bag in a death grip against my skinny chest, hoping I was just having a nightmare. Really, today? Yes, today, of course today. When else is there, little snake? She dropped a tightly folded blanket on top of the rucksack, and the weight of densely woven sheep wool caused me to hiss with discomfort and sit up, shifting the parcel's combined weight to my lap. Can I live down the river? I asked, fumbling for my spectacles. The world sharpened when I slipped them over my eyes. If you do, it better be so far downstream that I never see your scaly tail again, kid. And my dismayed grasp, Mama's expression softened, and she added, if I let all my children stay here, we'd run out of food, space, and patience. You can make one exception, I ventured, for me? Absolutely not. That'd be unfair. Mama pointed south with her nose. Leave now and you'll reach the damn town before nightfall. The beavers usually have room for a lodger. 
And if I and if they don't, I muttered, you're a cottonmouth, she snickered, sleep under a bush. As if to demonstrate, Mama switched from her false form to her true form. She slithered out of her dress and bared curved venom-filled teeth in my direction, warming me to skedaddle. Okay, okay. With a final wistful look at my favorite sunning rock in the family cottage, a squat dome of moss-covered stones, I heaved the rucksack over my shoulder and scooped up the blanket. Its fabric, which smelled of sage and smoke, felt dense under my fingers. Goodbye, Mama, I said. She reigned silent until I turned my back on home and started trudging down the riverside. Goodbye, Ollie. You'll be all right. All right. <laughs> Those are the two chapters. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Uh, that's super awesome. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so I want us let's I want to take a step back for a second and just kind of catch up a little bit in the sense of one of the the first times I think we had the chance to meet was at literally the beginning of the pandemic for lots of way right mm -hmm. so here you are you've been writing books and you're writing books and you're doing all this other stuff how has that been for you as a writer during this last two years right because we're coming on the second anniversary so how has that been for you in terms of you know, I mean, obviously there's the issue with being in person with the book launches, but just writing and gaining, you know, how do you, how have you gone about that part of the craft? Yeah, and it's been, so I don't really have anything to compare it to since my first book was published in 2020. Um, but just from a personal level, uh, um, some some people they're like, oh, writers they should be fueled by you know adversity and sorrow and all that, but that's not necessarily true. And and for me, it's difficult for me to create, especially these these beautiful fantasy worlds when things are difficult. Um, so there's been a great deal of loss in my family these past two years, uh, and sometimes that does make it hard especially because when you're a writer uh, with an indie publisher who, uh, Levine Carito has been great, by the way, um, but you have to kind of promote yourself and your book and be like, oh, I'm so happy this, this thing has just been published. Um, so that's your work side. But on the other side, like when things are going on in your personal life, that can sometimes be difficult. Um, so one thing I appreciate is that during some of the rougher times, uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, librarians, small bookstore uh, owners uh, like you, um, also friends uh, who are also writers, they've been the ones to share the news about my writing. Um, but yeah, it's it's been difficult. And I think a lot of people really are in that state where there's a lot of you know, personal loss and grieving, and it can be hard to connect with people for support um, when, especially early in this pandemic, when there are these uh, you know, quarantining and social distancing. Um, so I feel like a lot of us almost are grieving alone and yet we're in this together because we're experiencing the same types of things. So uh, Snake Falls to Earth was actually written during the most difficult year of my life. But I did find that, you know, contrary to a lot of a lot of things I created. Um, a Snake Falls to Earth was not difficult to write when I was sad. And I think that's probably because um, the world I was in was, it was this escape from uh, the world that I was living in real life. But on the other hand, it's also connected to a lot of things that I feel are important um, for us people living on Earth together uh, with the threat of the climate change and also with these responsibilities to really protect our elders, not just from climate change, but from other things that might put them at risk, including stuff like viruses. Um, so a big part of the story is Nina trying to find a way to protect her grandmother and to learn why her grandma like can't live, uh, literally cannot leave her uh, home because she gets like sick and it turns out to be something rather magical um in her case but that theme of just uh, protecting your family and your friends and, and your communities kind of resonated in this book and i think it might have been partially just because of the world we all were living in right 
I, I think that's, it's fascinating in that sense. And I find that to be a kind of a common thread with a lot of indigenous writers is, and, right. and, a, and multiple genres is this, you know, it's not an idealization of family, but it is this idea of that really strong um, community relationship, right? And and even potentially projecting the, the ideals of that community relationship, right? When we when we bring that into play, I think that that in a lot of the writing that I've done, that's always I was like, listen, they can be villains, but they're always doing something for their family, right? Like no matter what. And, yeah. and I see that, you know, I've, I've seen that very strongly in the work that, that you've done in the past, you know, right. couple of books and the comic work, you know, and the things that you've done, kind of your short story, yeah. you you bring this sense of family and community that I think is really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think really necessary, uh, you know, while simultaneously that very much a, a refreshing perspective, a, a refreshed perspective on indigeneity mm -hmm. and how that plays out in a place like Texas, right? Because yes. as we've talked about, you know, Texas did a really good job of wiping out the native population, yes. right? So yes. it's like, you know, there's like, it's scattered to basically the borders of the state for the native folk, the recognized native folks that are in that space. And so, you know, the, what I, you know, what I, I really appreciate about your writing is, is bringing those elements into play. And, and as I was saying, and, and, bringing to you, you know, the accolades, but it, it is, I think you are at that vanguard because we see this with a lot mm -hmm. of the writers, yourself, Stephen Graham Jones, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Tracy Sorrell, folks like that, that are really reconceptualizing indigeneity in a way that's very modern. Um, and that's, I think much, you know, that that's taking it that next step, taking Native Lit the next step. I want to go back a second. How has it been? Because we both know, uh, you know, uh, Arthur Levine and Levine Querido, uh, which was so gracious to help us get this set up. So I do want to give a shout out to LQ for their amazing support of Native writers in this space. But how has that been for you working with them? Yeah, and um, I'm trying to think, yeah, back when I first sold Alatsoe, Actually, Levine Carito was, or Arthur Levine, I should say, Levine Carito would, hadn't been created yet. That's um, right. That's true. But he was yep. uh, working with Scholastic um, under, I believe, their own imprint. So I sold it to Nick, my editor, um, thinking that that's where it would go. And then there was this uh, formation of Levine Carito. So that group essentially split off. They're going to form their own publisher. Um, and I had to choose between the two. And one thing that really drew me to Levine Carrito, uh, obviously my editor, uh, who was great, and and Nick, Nick, he's a type of editor who really works to understand um, what the writer is trying to do with their book. Uh, and if there's changes that a writer, um, you know, you could talk it through with him. Uh, so I felt that he, was doing a good job respecting um, my goal with the Latsoe. Uh, but of course, he also gave some really great suggestions for edits, and it changed quite a bit uh, from its draft to its final form. And the same with The Snake Falls to Earth. Um, but it was that respect and that drive to publish um, voices that haven't really gotten a lot of representation from big publishing, but also just to let us tell our own stories right. and not to box us in to a certain type of story. Um, so obviously a snake falls to earth is, is quite different from a lot of young adult books out there in terms of structure, um, as well as characters and, and they never tried to pressure me not to write that book um, right. or to write towards trend or that type of thing. Um, so I did choose to go with them. And that's one of the strengths of Living Carito is just the way that they're championing, championing <laughs> <laughs> tongue tied there. Um, writers, you know, for, for many different backgrounds, but also giving them the opportunity to tell their stories in the way that they want them to be told. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been it's been cool, and uh, I ne I never I never look back on that and say oh I should I should have gone with Scholastic. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, that's and I think that's one of the things that we know 
when we talk about a little bit about the industry and especially a lot of native folks working in the industry is that we tend, you know, what, what you've really seen is that a lot of, we're clustering around a lot of like, almost like indie producers. I mean, even if you look at Cynthia, like Smith's, you know, with heart drum, yes. it's all, it's like an imprint in a big, you know, in, in Simon and Schuster, but it's like this little tiny community. And I think that's that connection, right? It's this little, it's this really, and, the, and those writers are really tight. Like same thing, you know, with LQ, same thing with Charles Bridge, um, you know, like, and, and there, I think what is really exciting to see is the way that those editors are recognizing and, and I want to ask this question is, do you think, I mean, from your comments, and I, I know Nick as well, um, you know, a, a great editor, very tall fellow. Um, <laughs> he is he's tall. <laughs> very tall. I'm six two. And like what I, I was like, hey, nice to meet you. I was like, he's a tall dude. Um, but I, I think what, what I've gleaned from a lot of folks and I've also from your experience is that not only is it's good editing, which makes the writing tighter, which is we always want, but also in a way deferring to you and okay. your understanding of indigeneity, not telling you how to like, can you native it up a little bit? So yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to add like, it's sort of rhetorical, but I, I'm assuming that's been the experience, right? Because I feel that's been a lot that a lot of people are, that what we're seeing now is a lot of people having that experience where they're not having to like, okay, like, but I don't get the native part of it, right? But we're getting these editors who are almost educating a new generation of editors. So like, how is, I guess I want to say, how is, how have those conversations been with Nick in terms of right. in, no, in talking about those great. things? Like, um, there's <sighs> been no instance where he is, because like something that you mentioned in this conversation is that sometimes you do encounter edits and this is actually it's not happened to me it's happened to friends of mine um, but i've been fortunate uh not to have this experience but the editor has some idea of what the native experience could be or even worse what type of native experience sells uh because that drives a lot of a lot of not just publishing but other types of media they're like oh we want to we want to sell this to make a big profit to as much people and they have this idea of what that would entail um and you know sometimes might be like hey can you add more i don't know i'm just going to use this as an example but like more feathers or something like that right. obviously it's usually more complicated than that but um and i have never had that experience with nick uh, so that's something that hopefully is changing just as people mm -hmm. start to recognize not just that there is such a, a variety of experiences that being native um like first of all if you look at just the amount of native nations in the united states mm -hmm. itself there's hundreds um and we have different cultures uh, but also at an individual level we're humans we have different personalities right. different interests um, a lot of my friends are, are, are like goths and metalheads and that type of horror fans. So that's the type of, of people I hang out with, as you can tell. But, you know, also nerds. I have a lot of nerd friends. Um, I myself am a nerd, I, or at least I would consider myself. I'm wearing my book nerd shirt. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's like uh, just this recognition that we are human and the more stuff that's getting published, especially from these small imprints. Um, I think the more that's going to take hold and make it easier for future generations of writers to tell their story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's part of the, 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 the change and, and the continuation. I mean, what I, I also very much appreciate is the, you very much your prolific nature, right? Like you started writing and you're just like, and I think the last time we talked, you're like, it's what I do now. And I was like, that's awesome, right? Because you were just like, I was trained as a, you know, as a biologist, I'm a scientist. And then I just kind of started writing. And then uh, now I just have st haven't stopped. But I think it's really critical, right? Because, uh, you know, we get into these spaces of kind of a one and done or, you know, like some, or, or what I see with a lot of like, you know, emerging native writers is that some of them just like can't, it's getting over that hump, right? And, and getting into these spaces um, you know, where it's like, okay, you gotta, but you have to keep writing. It's what's the next story. Um, you know, I, I was very much reminded of this. I don't know, you know, for our, our literary audience, if you watch Tick, Tick, Boom, 
um, on Netflix, right? So it talks about Jonathan Larson. He was talking with his agent at the next. And it was just like, it was a beautiful show. It was wonderful. No one's going to pick it up. And he's like, well, what do I do? And she's like, you start on the next one. And I was like, that's it, right? Like, that's the crux of it, right? And so, you know, you've had these retreats and you're constantly writing and you're constantly moving on that. How are you, how are you balancing all of this stuff that you write? How do you do that to be able to write this story and to launch, you know, again, uh, Snake Falls to Earth? And I know you've got other projects uh, and other things, which we'll talk about in a second, but how are you balancing that as a writer? How are you continuing to write, especially in difficult times? Yeah, and it's something where I think that the more, so I started out publishing short stories because for me, that was the easiest way to get my foot in the door. Um, I was a college student at the time, a grad student, uh, and a lot of these short story fantasy science fiction markets, like you just send it in uh, electronically and they reject you or they accept you. Um, and so that was just me, basically, I just write whatever I felt like in whatever time frame I felt like. Uh, then, of course, the Lats Away was published, and that started to get me more opportunities to write, which um, honestly, overall, that's great. Uh, for example, I just finished submitting five short stories to various anthology projects. Um, but on the other hand, you also have to be selective in what you take on. And, and kind of what I've learned is that if a project doesn't genuinely make you excited, um, don't don't do it. Like, uh, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. try to write for happiness and for your passion. Um, and that's what I do with the projects I'm balancing. But it could be hard because sometimes I want to do too many stuff. and. And I'm like, okay, maybe I can write them both at the same time, but there's just not enough time. And the, it's like, I wish I didn't have to sleep. Yeah, like that, <laughs> just like that. And even I've outlined my next book and I'm just so impatient to get mm -hmm. beyond, to just to finish it because like, there's all these scenes I wanna write and that's not possible. Like at, at most, mm -hmm. I'm the type of writer who can write a thousand words a day. Uh, maximum. Some people can definitely go higher, but for me, right. if I start to do more than that, my writing deteriorates. Um, so you imagine it's like a, a ninety thousand word book. That's that's going to take a lot of a lot of days. Uh, so it's it's right. trying to balance just this this drive to create with real realistic uh, expectations because I'm not going to be able to write two books in a month. That's just not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, you know, that's key, right. Is, is, is mm -hmm. understanding that. And I think, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of follow up on that. Do you think that you've sort of settled into that now that this is your second book, you know, second, like big, we'll say big release. Cause you've had, you know, comics and other successes coming into this, yeah. but your second, like chunky chunky book right lots of lots of pages um no pictures no pictures um do you think you settled into that or are you still kind of finding your way around how to how to do that you know like uh as a writer being a writer capital w yeah and i i am definitely still trying to find um my groove i guess what works best for me as a writer um uh, Hopefully, hopefully I'll get that soon. But I know that some people say it's a lifelong uh, process, especially because you yourself change over time. Um, mm. But it's gotten easier, I think, uh, especially because with with the, the second book coming out, you have these worries that maybe your debut, uh, people were reading it because you're this fresh new writer and with your second book, what if they're not interested or what if it's too different from the first book? And just having that out of the way has been great because now I could just write my third book and, and um, my fears, uh, at least with the second book, have been resolved. Uh, but again, it's always just this, this concern, will I get readers? but the need just to ignore that question while you're writing, because ultimately it is about telling the story that you want to tell. And just hopefully it does find the readers who will connect with it. And a lot of that is up to chance and just whether that book gets into the right hands. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's 
both for readers and I think, you know, the sort of the pathway, right? So like yeah. people that kind of see the, the work and recognize the merit of the work, um, you know, and again, not having to add, you know, feathers of fry bread <laughs> to, <laughs> you know, to really, to build it up, right? Uh, it's, it's that the writing that, that you put together um, has, has its own uh, intrinsic value and it, it comes from this like sort of center point of community, indigeneity, uh, you know, uh, and, and fantasy, right? So, so like this, this realm of imagination. And I think that that's, that's always been the thing that struck me the most, right? So, um, so in that transition, so you, you trained as a scientist, uh, you started writing short stories, started doing comic books, you got your, you definitely got your indigenous cred and your badge, uh, and now you're writing this kind of work. What, what's left? What's next? What else are you going to write? What do you got to do? Are you, are you getting on a spaceship? You, what, what's happening? I mean, oh, man, uh, actually, I was going to say, I wish, but then I realized if I can't even get on a roller coaster, there's no right? way I could, every I time be the person standing on earth waving like this. <laughs> be like, it's been nice. You guys are awesome. Space. Bye. Enjoy yep. your G force. Uh, yep. But yeah, aside from that, uh, I am working on a young adult book project right now. Um, and that one still is in that phase where you can't really talk about it, but or I do know it's going to be published. Because uh, sometimes that's not always certain. Like, you got to get that contracted. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but also, I, I think I'd like to, I've actually planned out uh, an adult book that I'd like to try. And this one, uh, I don't like to use the word literary uh, because it's not, it, it's, I don't really understand like the way that books are classified so well. I think I just don't have that MFA English background uh, where you kind of learn that type of stuff. But uh, it's, it's a project that I haven't started writing, but I have started just thinking about it and outlining it. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, in addition to that, there's a short, a short comic um, coming out from um, Jim Henson, the Storyteller uh, series. Ooh, nice. uh, yeah, I'm actually in uh, the, the shapeshifter part of that. So it's a story about cool. a dancer, a ballet dancer to be specific, and just um, it takes place over her lifetime. So I, I hope that people enjoy reading that. And uh, there's about five short stories that are going to be coming out sporadically over the next year or two. So those as well. Brilliant. So yeah, to, you got to write it with both hands. That's what you got to do. We want we want more stories. Would you feel like uh, regaling us with a little bit more? Do you have another little section that you can read from? Because we'd love to hear a little yeah, bit more than... Well, while you're doing that, we'll do, you can get prepped. I'm going to say after this, thank you all. Uh, this is uh, so great. Uh, we, you know, uh, that we have Darcy here. We want to give a big shout out to Levine Carrido uh, as the publisher of A Snake Falls to Earth. You can find A Snake Falls to Earth here in the chat uh, with the link to Red Planet Books and Comics, your only native comic shop in the world. We're very thrilled uh, that we have continued. This is going to be our fifth year coming up. Uh, in existence as our shop. You can order everything online, of course. Um, and after we have Darcy read a little bit more, uh, we'll open it up if you have questions. Uh, we, uh, I'm sure she would be glad to, or she could be like, nope, show's over. So we'll kind of leave it up to her. Uh, but uh, if you have some questions for her about the book, about writing, uh, about anything in between, um, this, now that would be the time. So Darcy, if you got another little section you'd like to read for us, sure. we would love to hear it. And I got to I gotta shout out my mom, <laughs> Linda, the <laughs> walking woman. Uh, I don't normally call her by first day. I'm just identifying her based on screen. <laughs> so mom, you better ask me a question. I'm serious. <laughs> I got you. Uh, I'm going to read a chapter um, that takes place just a tiny bit later in the book, like it's still near the beginning. Uh, and this is from Nina's perspective when she's age 13. And just for context, by this time, her great-great-grandmother has told her a story that's in the Lipan language that nobody really understands what it means yet. Um, so that's that's her motivator for the first part of the book, just trying to understand what this story means by translating it. 
Nina sat cross-legged in front of a coffee table, her back steadied against a stack of toy-filled cardboard boxes. Grandma, always questing for presents to give her grandchildren, offers, often scoured the local garage sales and flea markets for toys. She seemed to forget that every year, another grandchild aged out of dollies or relocated north of the peril zone. Nina was among the last remaining family in Texas, and at 13, she hardly needed a button-eyed teddy bear. Her bed was already overflowing with plushies. But that didn't stop her from accepting Grandma's gift with a grin and an enthusiastic, oh, thanks. Somewhere, thunder rumbled, and the overhead lights flickered. With the bear sitting on her lap, Nina shifted anxiously. Her cotton shirt, flattened between cardboard and skin, was sticky with sweat. Even under the shade of storm clouds, South Texas was dangerously hot. A busted air conditioning unit could mean death, especially for elders like Grandma, who could not or would not move. Not for heat, not for drought, not even for hurricanes and their entourage of tornadoes, floods, and blackouts. The land under and around the three-bedroom house had been in their family's homeland for generations. Before Texas became a state, Nina's ancestors had lived there, and they didn't ever leave, not really. When federal Indian removal became the law of the land and bounties were put on Apache heads, her people resisted. In many ways, they still did. Officially, Rosita had bought the 15 acres of South Texas land in the early 1900s. She allowed most of her property to grow unimpeded beyond a well-trimmed backyard and a fenced-in patch of longhorn grazing land. There sprouted thick tangles of brush, mesquite trees, and all foreign plants with leaves shaped like green porcupine spines. Every morning, the jackalacas cheered. Every night, the screech hours cooled. And as nearby suburbs spread in the century that followed, covering the lands with identical yellow houses, pink condominiums, and gated neighborhoods named Paradise and Sunnyvale, the 15 acres became an island. The situation got sticky in the late 1900s. Rosita's property had grown too wild, too ugly. That's what the city charged. Fix it or lose it, they said. So she'd surrounded the whole thing with a stone wall, her younger family members laying each rock over the course of a skin-searing summer. If the people of Paradise and Sunnyvale thought her land was ugly, they didn't have to look at it. These days, section of the walls were missing, crumbling around the trunks of ever-growing mesquite trees. Other rocks, especially at the far end of the property where the family seldom ventured, were bright with graffiti. That didn't matter. Nina's grandmother, who'd taken over the house and Rosita died, seldom worried about fussy neighbors because there weren't many left. Paradise and Sunnyvale had closed after a terrible case of foundation subsidence flooding and a class action lawsuit. That meant the nearest neighbors were two introverted off the grid married women who shared a highly modded RV. They were friendly enough and mostly kept to themselves, in other words, perfect. However, Nina's worried, Nina worried, maybe the neighborhood dynamics would be changing again soon. She noticed a fresh sold sign down the street from grandma's place. Somebody had purchased the ruins of paradise. Why would anyone do that? Would they plan to renovate and reopen the graffiti painted adobe houses or tear it all down to build something new? Only time would tell and the family was powerless to do anything but wait. That was true of so many things these days. Nina glanced at the television screen, which was playing ominous maps from the Weather Channel. Last she checked, most projections showed the hurricane veering east. The worst would miss them, maybe. As her father always said, when it came to weather, a lot could change quickly. It was risky to trust predictions until the final day. Want a hint? Grandma asked, noticing Nina's reluctance to continue losing their game of checkers. Her voice was dulled by the metallic, quickening flop, flop, flop of rain, raindrops on the roof. The first half of summer had been thirsty, but just when the fruit trees and crops got too weak and withered for a decent harvest, the storm started. First, a Category 2 hurricane collided with Puerto Rico, its winds rippling west. Then a week of thunderstorms spun in tornadoes throughout Arkansas. Now more rainfall preceded a Category 4 hurricane that was arching through the Atlantic, veering straight towards Florida. There is one slender, faintly shimmering silver lining around the roiling clouds of hurricane season. Every time the Weather Channel predicted a big storm, Nina and her dad visit grandma's house to check on things. They top the pantry, top up the pantry with canned foods, prep the generator, and check the batteries and all the flashlights. At the moment, her father was buying sodas, canned soup, and bread at the nearest grocery store. Once he'd returned, they'd head straight home. 
It was a two hour drive and the risk of bad weather driving increased after sunfall. Even since even a mist of rain could transform into a glowing disorienting curtain in the truck's bright headlights. Can't you come with us today, Grandma? Nina asked. I know the hurricane won't go through Texas, but Nina could recall a time she must have been four, five, or six old, six years old, when Grandma ventured away from the homeland in Rosita to visit the bookshop every month. They'd read together and bake oatmeal cookies in the narrow apartment kitchen. What had changed? These days, Grandma rarely left her property, much less traveled beyond county limits. It could be fun, you ought to see the renovations we made to the nonfiction section. I painted the historical quotes on the wall. That sounds perfect. Do you have photos? Pictures aren't the same thing as being there. Nina, I wish I could. Grandma rubbed her forehead as if massaging away a headache. Lately, travel doesn't sit well with me. I guess it's part of aging. When people cry when they're homesick, and I get terrible migraines and indigestion. It's rough to enjoy anything when you feel like death warmed over, honey. And I'll stop there, but yeah, it turns out that the more time that passes, um, the more difficult it is for her grandmother to actually leave until she can't. Um, and so that's that's something that uh, Nina actually has to look into with her friends when the animal people come to Earth. Brilliant. Bravo. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give you some applause there. I, I, I just find it every time it, uh, and again, I like heaping praise, but just listening to you read, I'm just like, man, I need to start writing like right now. Like yes. I just need to like, I'm I... like, this is done. Show's over. I've got to start like, like it's just really inspirational. So I just want to say Ooh, I always, every time we get done chatting, I'm just like, Man, where's my pen? I gotta start like yeah, writing get, ideas get down. So start writing now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I fully, I fully uh, endorse that. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so we'll leave that there, uh, folks. Uh, if you, any of our our folks that are out in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question of our amazing writer and guest this mm -hmm. evening. Darcy Little Badger. Uh, please, now is the time. You, you can either raise your hand or you can unmute and uh, you can ask your question. And thank you so much for being here, everyone. Yes. <laughs> thank you all. We do have a question from Judith. Go ahead, Judith. Hello. Um, type it in the chat, too. Okay. I love, I've loved both your books. I've loved your comics work. I haven't read any of your short stories yet. So I've got stuff to look up immediately. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things I really like about your writing is that um, blend of the fantastic with the completely and totally realist grounded day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think it works really, really well. Um, at the end of the, uh, when a snake falls to earth, there are hints at other adventures. And yes. while I think the novel ends brilliantly on its own and it stands really well on its own, I was wondering if we're going to see any of those other adventure, adventures later on. Yeah, oh, and first of all, thank you so much for the compliments of uh, Ed. I definitely intentionally, uh, especially from Ollie's perspective and, and his friends setting off to find his, his siblings, um, did leave it open to a continuation. And a lot of that was because I had so much fun writing in this, this reflecting world where all these like fantastic things live, um, but couldn't put everything that I wanted to in this one book. So there's definitely that that opportunity of a second and uh, really it's 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 up to the whims of publishing whether i'll get that chance to continue but certainly if i do there's a lot to say there that's exciting something for us to look forward to uh if uh you know, and i didn't say you can also put it into the chat if you would like as well but if there's other questions anyone have any other questions i'd like to go ahead yeah, I see I'm, um... <laughs> that you took to heart our traditions and storytelling. And when you were young and I was telling you all about Coyote and how Coyote went walking along and all the other animal people, 
uh, that you were listening. And in fact, as I was reading the end of Snake, I was thinking just exactly the same thing as Judith was saying, that this was just a splendid opportunity for Ollie to continue walking along. But I find that with your short stories too, there's just so much that you put into them that I want to hear more. Is it a possibility that you will take some of these beautiful characters that you put into these short stories and expand them into a book? Oh, uh, I would like, so I was literally before this call writing a short story and I've got to send that to you to read when it's done. Um, and I was very sad because there's a limit of 5,000 words. And I was like, I could write a whole book with this. So that's something that I'd, I'd like to do with a lot of my short stories uh, is see if there's anything there that I can expand. Um, because that is the shame of, <laughs> I, I find that I enjoy writing books because there's a lot more room for me as a writer just to explore the worlds and the characters and send them on longer adventures. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I try my best to listen to everything you tell me, um, uh, because it's, it's, it's I've got to say that you and dad really your support, but also the way that you uh, pass down all of this, this knowledge and your own um, wisdom uh, has, has helped me reach this point in my life where I can tell stories that, that I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd be here if y'all didn't like support me in that way. So I got to say that one of my biggest advantages of a writer is just having parents who have always been there and have been just some such uh, like sources of, of wisdom and love. And thank you so much for seeing me. My mom, like she always, she always comes to support me with these. <laughs> it's brilliant. Thank you. Yes, it's great to have Ringer family in the audience. Thank you for joining us. And thanks for telling her the story so we get all these good books. Yes. So we're really just going to thank you. From now on, I'm, we'll just have you on. And you can just tell us. I'm the okay with this that. It's awesome. It's perfect. Just flip that around. Um, Michelle, you have a question. First, I just wanted to say, Es Creek Asco, Darcy. I remember when Beth LaPonce had asked us years ago to put together the comics in the collection. And, like, yes. you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no, And then I remember you were in the same section I was. So I got to see yours in advance. And how you had even written your introduction to the comic was like really inspirational for me. So I have a two part question. One is yeah. writing practical and one is totally impractical. But Linda and Darcy, I want to know how's the new place? Like you're living my dream, which is like to be able to go back to our homelands and you know what I mean? And have a place there and have multiple generations there. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of that. But Darcy, I was also wondering, one of the things with that comic is it sort of like uncorked all these stories. And right now I'm trying to figure out like, I'm a new professor at a new university and, and I'm drowning in admin right now. And if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about sort of how you structure your day with different projects, like at sure. which point do you do the 1K yeah. of writing? And, and then right now I have like lots of voice memos of all these different story ideas. And yes. I would love to get some insights into how you structure the day. Like is this organizing right. and then this writing or what have you? Yeah, awesome. and I got to say that it's a lot easier for me to do this since I started writing full time. Um, so a lot of writers don't have that luxury. Like you have so so many responsibilities associated with one job. And it really is it, it really is like it's fun to create, but also it's a, it's another job, um, especially if you want to write something that's getting published, you have to go through editing and all these things. Um, so the way I structure my day is I find that I can only really concentrate on one writing project uh, at a time within the day. Um, whereas I can, so I usually like figure out what deadline is most immediate, but also what do I feel the most inspiration to write that day? <laughs> Cause that can also affect like how, how quickly you write is how much you're feeling that project. So like something I would recommend is just look at that list of ideas and which one of them just like really, really like uh, lights a fire within you. Uh, and I'm trying to think when I was a scientific editor and writing, um, it would be where I would put aside, usually I, I'd pick two days of the week where I didn't have as much 
other work stuff going on and just say I'm going to write, sit down and start writing. Um, and like my goal would be a certain number of words, but never really press yourself to reach that if you can't, especially because, <laughs> you know, it's better to write good words than to force yourself to write. <laughs> Not so great words, which I have done before. And then in editing, you have to be like, oh, you're just going to have to cut this whole section and redo this thing. Um, but yeah, another thing is I tend to write better at night. Uh, so really, yeah, find that that creative time um, if you have one, like whether it's the morning or maybe lunchtime or nighttime. Uh, and it does seem to vary with my friends. Some of them wake up like at 5 a.m. and they they start writing and by the time it's it's like breakfast they've already done like a thousand words and I'm so jealous of them <laughs> I wish I had that drive but yeah um, mom do you want to answer so my mom does like after a lifetime of really fighting to be home and like renting she finally has a home in San Marcos Texas which is our homeland so uh, how's it been, Mom? It's been wonderful. Um, I think what I appreciate about this space, not only that, it's our space. Uh, and uh, I think your dad would have loved it so much that we can walk out and I have this beautiful piece of land with plants and animals and I appreciate the walk. And I know that when you are here, you love that because Darcy sits outside in a canopy with a screen and she's outside with nature and that's where she does her most wonderful writing. So I loved here, absolutely. And I gotta yes. mention that today she actually went to the backyard and picked a bunch of these little chili and made, what did you make those into? Uh, some vegan chili. <laughs> Yes, my brother's a vegan. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, the uh, the little native chili of Texas. I try to put it on Instagram, and uh, it's called the Mother of Chilies because this is the supposedly the original chili. But when I put that on Instagram, <laughs> they totally deleted it <laughs> because of the word Mother of. So um, I had to revise. Oh. It. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> yeah, but uh, yes, uh, the little plants they grow out there a while. That was able to go over and got a whole bunch of them, and it just took about an eighth of a cup and uh, put it into the chili, and didn't need to use any cayenne pepper or chili powder. It just had that fact. It was just wonderful. Brilliant. Uh, it sounds beautiful, and I know your homeland very well. I went to school at Texas State, so go Bobcats! Um, so it's I know I know your area, and it is absolutely lovely. And, and congratulations on on coming getting back home. It's so fantastic. So, um, which I think is a good segue as we can close out for all of you to stay home or be home or go home as you so choose. Uh, but I want to say thank you so much, Darcy, uh, for joining me here. Uh, as always, it is it is an inspiration. I literally wrote down, I wrote down creative time on my board. I'm going to make that a thing. I was like, creative time. So I got that on my board now. So that will remind me. Um, and But truly, uh, I, as I have said, and, and I will continue to say uh, to those that ask uh, and to those that are looking for, you are in this cutting edge of new writers. You are such an incredible and dynamic voice of native writers that is absolutely necessary as we continue to change the perceptions and misrepresentations of native people, that we are not historical anachronisms, that we are not these relics of the past, that we're not dead and dying, but that we are bright and alive and beautiful and imaginative and brave, bold and brilliant. So I just wanna to continue to thank you for that. Uh, and all of your writing uh, and everything that you've got planned. Mad success coming up. I um, want to thank all of you for joining us here this evening. You can find us at redplanetbooksncomics.com. You can find a Snake Falls to Earth in our bookstore or your local bookstore. Please support those. If you are in the Texas area, you can also check out La Resistencia Books, which is in South Austin, which is one of the other, there's only seven of us as native bookstores and native bookstore owners. 
Uh, and uh, Red Salmon Arts and, uh, and Resistencia in South Austin is an amazing bookstore, uh, locally owned. It's been like community driven, community led for many years. So that's another place that you can find any of your bookstore needs. You can check them out online. In the meantime, we hope you'll join us again. I want to say next month, check us out on our social medias. We have uh, Tracy Sorrell joining us for her new book uh, that's coming out. So you can check out one of our new readings and a new book that's coming out. I think it's, yeah, I want to say it's uh, mid-February. So, and I'm sorry, I don't have the date because we're still trying to get everybody uh, locked in on our timing, but check us out. You can check us out on any of the social media platforms, Red Planet Books and Comics on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. If you're looking for Lee Francis, yours truly, you can find me at Lee Francis IV on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram under Pueblo Jones. Of course, you can find me on Facebook at Lee Francis. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight. It's so amazing to have you. And Darcy, thank you for all your writing, your time, your passion, your stories, uh, and these wonderful characters that you bring into this world. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, I just, You've been such like a support, not just for me, but for other native writers, including emerging writers. And I really appreciate that. And it was just wonderful to talk to you today. As always, as always. Thank you, everybody. Be well, be wonderful. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.